welcome to a podcast about something where each week we dive deep into whatever it is we find interesting. I'm your host, Calvin, and joining me from the lists at Heron Hall, it's your co-host, Nick Richardson. There's some shit going down here. It's, uh, it's very tense. Nick, the microphoned knight. Here, no. Richardson. No. Nick, the MP3 knight. There we go. It's a little uh, catchier. <laughs> they were both fucking awful. <laughs> yeah, they're not good. They're not good. We'll, we'll, we'll work on Nick's uh, nicknames before next week. Uh, but this week, the we're night talking of about... <laughs> yeah, the night of something. <laughs> Anything. Uh, we're talking about the tourney at Hall from A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones, even though it never really came up during Game of Thrones, I don't think. Uh, when Mira talked about it. Did she talk about it in Game of Thrones? I don't remember. I guess that would have been like season three or four of Game of Thrones. I yeah. don't really remember. She told Bran the, the story because she's like, oh, you didn't hear about this idiot? And he's like, oh, no, my dad wasn't around me very much. Some old bag was telling me, you know, stuff. And then she proceeded old, to tell old him. Old man wanted to tell stories about giants and walls coming down and horns and shit. Yeah, that was that was way out of left field. I wouldn't have bought that either. But this, this I buy. Because she, yeah, uh, big focus on Night of the Laughing Tree. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to the Night of the Laughing Tree. First, let's kind of lay out what a song of ice and fire actually is for those of you who have been living under a rock for the last i don't know 10 years or so uh it's tits and dragons mostly <laughs> i mean if there isn't at least two deaths during a dothraki wedding there's it's also a that dull affair it's yeah. a dull affair uh i don't know some people might have just purged this from their mind had some ptsd of some sort yeah I mean, well that's that's why we're talking about this event that mostly only relates to the books uh because it, it, it Mira may have told the story. I don't remember if you're saying she did, then she did, but it, it never came back up. And it's a pretty important story and plays into kind of the end game of some of the characters. So I, I think they kind of did a, dis, a disservice in the show, regardless of if they actually covered it. So we're mostly going to be talking about from the book world, which, you know, a song of ice and fire is a wildly popular series of fantasy novels written by George R. R. Martin based in the fictional world of Westeros and more specifically the seven kingdoms of Westeros. Um, and it kind of details the power struggles within these seven kingdoms and the human slash dragon stories that play into these struggles. And tits. Yeah. So, and dragons. So yeah, tons. Uh, the even more popular HBO show Game of Thrones was based on these novels as well. And, um, you know, where the novels have ended is far more satisfying than where the show ended. Oh. Even if we never get the last two. Yeah, uh, even we probably will never get the last two. It's just my guess because all these prequels he's fucking working on. But I'm okay with it. And like I mean, mentioned, he was supposed to be locked in a cabin in New Zealand for the last year during a pandemic. What the hell is he doing? I mean, he got got to write about tits, and he's like, I can't do. It's fucking hot in here. Uh, I gotta get out. Good old George, we're pulling for you. We want you to finish. Actually, no. I let me tell you what, George. Fucking sick of you, man. Sick of this wow. shit. Hot take. The, the, from Nick, yeah. uh, the procrastination is utterly unreal. I had a I had about a forty five minute conversation with this with a friend of mine who uh pretty much any time you mention Game of Thrones, he's like, Oh, oh the fuck and he just gets immediately dramatic he he's a self proclaimed cinephile. Uh yeah. which I think, I think is he's mentioned him here stupid. before. Yes. He's cool, but calling yourself a cinephile, I think, is just a little bit dweeby. Very dweeby. Dweeby. Shout out dweeb. <laughs> Fucking loser. Um, but yeah, he's like, I honestly think he's just bored with it and he'll never come back to it. So we're just left with this. But he's this. not doing anything else. Like, he's working he on his all prequels these, a little bit. I guess. He, he had all these other stories, all these sci-fi uh, stories and novels that he wrote before. And, like, if he was going back into those worlds or working on a new world or something like that, then I get it. Or even, like, the ancillary stuff, like the um, the Dunkin' Egg stories or the um, Blood, of, uh, Blood of the Dragon. Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood. Blood of the Dragon. Yeah. If, if he was working on those things, which I guess he was working on Fire and Blood not too long ago, 
then that makes sense. But it just seems like he's not working on anything. And, and I mean, he's 75 years old or something. So like when I'm 75, I'm not going to be out there working on shit either, but he's also saying he is working on things and doesn't seem to be. So, you know, we're not, we're not here completely to take down George, but you know, we'll take a, we, we took a minute to do it. Yeah. I mean, we got to tell it like it is next week on airing of grievances. We'll, we'll really get into our George R. R. Martin. Here. George R. R. Martin, you fat bastard. So let's talk about a little bit what and where is Heron Hall, uh, where this tournament is held. What, what do you got for kind of a backstory on Heron Hall? Heron Hall is the biggest castle in the Seven Kingdoms. It's fucking ginormous, ungodly big, uh, black as fuck. <laughs> yeah, and, built out of dragon glass mostly. Yes, uh, once got melted by a dragon. Yeah, um, it's located in the northern shore of the God's Eye Lake, at the heart of the Riverlands, south of the River Triton, and northwest of King's Landing. So you know, so it, everybody broke out their Westerosi map before we got into this, right? You guys know what we're talking about. You guys know where King's Landing is. It's south. So think of northwest of there. Yeah, and the Trident being you know one of the most important river systems in the entire history of that world. I think people should be. Oh yeah, know, no, I know. I, I, most I important some fun river there. in the Riverlands, and uh, yeah, it, you can think of it as like an ancillary, ancillary. Fuck, I can't talk. Ancillary, ancillary, ancillary. Yeah, uh, I already said that word once tonight, so I, I had it in my head. Nice, my man. <laughs> it's like Worcestershire. Ooh, uh, I can't do that one. See, I mean. I said this once tonight. I'm all, I got it. <laughs> yeah, you just need to pack it up. There, it should not come. That word should not come up for the rest of this episode. You should be good. Watch, it's the biggest word on our little word cloud. Yeah, you know what I like when I eat my dragon meat. I really like to baste it in Worcestershire sauce. So I, I heard King Aries. He really liked dabbing that in his eyeballs. So he just looked like he'd been crying a lot to trick these people. It's he, the main ingredient in Wildfire, and the Knight of the Laughing Tree actually dipped their his or her sword in Worcestershire sauce before her lance, his or her lance in Worcestershire sauce before you know battling in in the tourney here. So it's, that way it's if, very important. Yeah, if he cut people, it'd sting really bad. So you know that's sick fuck. And uh, apparently, this is what Dothraki sprinkle on people as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just dragons like, Here, take some it, of this dragons you know they breathe fire onto some just lonely guy who's about to get eaten but first they you know they take a little Worcestershire out of their <laughs> pocket sprinkle it on them and then eat them you what are you a doing with a pocket? I mean apparently they have Worcestershire in there so in this what? world anything's possible saucer dripping on me ah! oh it fucking stinks and that's how we found out that sauce is extremely flammable um, so Heron Hall is it's uh currently at the time of what we're talking about, which is about two eighty one after Aegon's conquest, and so that's about twenty years before we pick up in uh Game of Thrones. It is the current seat at that time of House Went. Uh by the time we get there in Game of Thrones there's no one seated there and it eventually is given to Littlefinger and Littlefinger gives it to a bunch of other people but really Littlefinger actually owns it or at yeah owns it I guess or is the lord over it at the time uh, but in 281 its house went um, and the holdings around Harrenhal even though the the castle has become a dark and ruinous place the holdings surrounding it all the land surrounding are some of the richest in Westeros claiming vast tracts of green fertile land which reach as far as the hills of House Woad near the Crownlands. So Harrenhal's domain goes pretty much almost all the way to King's Landing. Yeah, it's fat. So I just mean, refer back to that map that you had out earlier. Yeah, guys. it's to the northwest. Just keep keep an eye out there. All of that shit, all of the north and west area, it's grasslands. But So like, let's say the Crownlands, King's Landing, that's Florida. Heron Hall is like Tennessee, and then everything between Tennessee and Florida. There you go. That's I think that's actually a perfect analogy. Fantastic analogy. <laughs> Except who wants King's Land to be in Florida? Nobody. I mean, all the old people would dig it. Like, uh, this is my home. This is my community. But <laughs> so Nick, 
Why why was why did House Went put on this tournament at the time? Well, there's multiple theories, Kevin. Or at least well, let what was the stated purpose? We'll we'll go into the ulterior motives later. Uh the potential this, ulterior motives. The stated purpose was he just wanted to be a fucking thug and then Jamie Lannister was gonna be inducted into uh the King's Guard. There's a bunch of little stuff going down. But most people thought it was a just a diversion. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll talk more about the diversion later. Let's, we're saving that in the five fundamental somethings about the tournament at Harrenhal next. Shut, shut the fuck. Shut. Up. Yeah, the stated reason Lord Walter went. He was celebrating the name day of his maiden daughter. Uh, the tournament spread over ten days. It was ah, the yeah. greatest tourney of its time. She was the fifth child too, which makes it even yeah. weirder. He's like, yeah, right. I just I love her so much. And a lot of important things, this is kind of what you alluded to, were happening at this tournament, and many consider this kind of the catalyst for Robert's Rebellion, and pretty much, many many fans, not many people in the world, I don't think a lot of people in the world connected these dots as well, but a lot of fans see this as the catalyst for Robert's Rebellion, and kind of the rest of everything we learn in Game of Thrones, and in the actual Song of Ice and Fire books. Yeah, this is a big deal. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a big deal, and that's why I'm not happy that it was downplayed as much as it was. That we just never came back to it. They were, they, I mean, we got how much total screen time do you think we got of you know like flashback scenarios? Maybe seven minutes. Yeah, With most I, of it being. I get that, and and the the creators, you know, Dave and Dan, they didn't want to do a lot of flashbacks and prophecy. Like that was their stated course when they started the show, but. I just like if you're going there with Bran and he's going to the Tower of Joy, I feel like turning at Heron Hall and Tower of Joy go hand in hand and you you need one to understand the other, to fully understand the other. And they just kind of skipped over it and we're just like, we'll just jam everything about Rhaegar and Lyanna into what happens after the Tower of Joy and, and, and that'll be that. Which is silly because that's major fucking context they're kind of leaving in the background. Yes. I think that would... That would have made and, and Branch is like they were in love. We know it because I saw them getting married in this vision, this one singular vision I had, not a series of things that happened to lead them to get married and have a child and for the king's yard to be protecting Liana at the Tower of Joy. It, it, it's not just that one thing. It's you know this series of events that happen that are completely ignored for so we can speed through the last season as quickly as possible. Bums. I'm not even going to rag on them. I've eviscerated those folks. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll talk more about them uh, next week on Airing of Grievances. A lot of yeah. Game of Thrones talk, apparently. Bring next your week. Worcestershire sauce. Yeah. <laughs> now you're just trying to get it on the on the word cloud. If I can get anything over fuck, I will be <laughs> ecstatic. We'll, we'll share a word cloud with all these uh, Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones type words, dragons, tournaments, horses, lances, Starks, Lannisters, and then Worcestershire sauce will just be in there somehow. Someone that likes barbecue is going to be like, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. <laughs> I don't want to hear what these guys have to say. Uh, so let's get into our five fundamentals, some things about the tournament here in Hall. We're going to talk about who was there, uh, what some of these ulterior stated ulterior motives for holding the tournament may have been what was going on with the Stark children at the tournament, uh, what was going on with the Night of the Laughing Tree, and who actually won the different events at the tournament, which aren't really as important as those items three and four, but that's okay. We we have to talk about who won, otherwise, you know, what's the point? I mean, it is a tournament. I gotta know. Yeah, exactly. It's so... Like madness. Just gotta check. So who was in attendance? Um, The host, like we said, was Lord Walter Went, and he offered a prize three times larger than those offered by Tywin Lannister in the tourney to honor Prince Viserys' birth, which was just four years before this. Um, Most thought House Went was trying to simply display their wealth and splendor to the rest of the kingdoms. Others thought that they lacked the funds for such large prizes and that the Wents were merely the quote-unquote shadow host as a front for the ulterior motives, which we'll talk about in our next point. Uh, do you have any other important people there? I mean, literally everyone, except yeah. for Tywin Lannister and the Seven Kingdoms, was That's here. true. I the, could... the king showed up. He wasn't supposed to be there, but he's there. King Aerys the Second Targaryen. That's a big deal. They hadn't, they hadn't been seen in, what, five years? Yeah, Seven something years like or something since like the, uh, the Defiance at Duskendale. 
I mean, he can't even wipe his own ass because his fingernails are so long. That's how long it's been. Yeah, he was a scary looking dude when he shows up at Heron Hall. This guy's crazy ass fuck. And right along with him, you got Jamie Lannister, who, as you said, is being being knighted and, and taking into the King's Guard at that point. Um, Ashara Dane is there. She plays a kind of important role. The Stark children are all there. Brandon, Eddard, Benjen, and Lyanna. Uh, Helen Reed makes an appearance. Robert Baratheon, Baratheon Rhaegar yeah. Targaryen. Uh, a little start to their feud. And like you said, just a lot of other people that I don't know that they're very important to the bigger picture of what's going on. Did you mention Barristan Selmy? Barristan Selmy was there. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned him, but yeah, he was there. He's big. I mean, he's semi-important semi he's yeah, important to, to the story that's told he's not important to what we're talking about i guess fair enough i mean that the only thing really to come from him is a shardane danced with one of the king's guard we don't know if it was her or her, if it was selmy or it could have been her brother arthur dane uh because like that not in like a incest way just usually like at these things people dance with family and they dance with suitors and they dance with other people like it's not just it's not all courtship i guess is what i'm trying to say so like it wouldn't have been weird for her to be dancing with her brother and barrison selmy later remarks to danny at one point that ashara was um disrespected in some way by one of the starks but he doesn't say which stark yeah, well, I mean, and he lost in that final joust with uh, Rhaegar. With so Rhaegar. I think that proves a point that I'll I'll touch on later on. Actually, yeah, keeping it a mystery. Let's then talk about what were some of these ulterior motives for holding the tournament at this time. You know, you said the first one earlier that King Ar- Ares is inducting Jamie Lannister into the King's Guard, which wasn't supposed to happen. No one knew it was going to happen. Uh, it was kind of surprised. Jamie's 15 at the time. He's the youngest King's Guard ever inducted. Um, and the, he gets inducted. Everybody loved Jamie. He was a great knight. Everybody thought he, you know, he would eventually go that route anyways. Um, so they're all cheering for him. And Ares assumes that these cheers are for him and not for Jamie. And uh, as you know from our past episode on All About Jamie Lannister, we would be cheering for Jamie too. Yeah. As episode 46, back from January of 2019, we uh, talked all about Jamie Lannister. He's a stud. He is. Um, Jamie really wanted to compete in the tourney, but he was not allowed to. Ares ordered him to return to King's Landing directly after admitting him onto the King's Guard uh, so he could go back and guard Queen Rhaella and Prince Viserys. It, it, this was cold-blooded. I mean, let's let's preface this whole thing with about nine people were pay- playing 4D chess and there's a whole lot of shit going down this being one of those eviscrations yeah I don't know that it's 4D chess here I, th- I think they thought they were playing 4D chess well to us it obviously doesn't look yeah. like it's you know on a computer screen it's a lot easier to follow but this is like don't... this is like Cersei thinking she's playing 4D chess in the last two books when she's just getting closer and closer to getting herself thrown in jail by the High Sparrow I mean, it does end badly for a lot of these folks. <laughs> so, some earlier than others, but it was really a kick to the nuts to Tywin Lannister because that's, yeah. that's his heir, at least the person he was going to depend on the most. Exactly. And Jamie, Eris er- and Tywin had this, this love hate relationship. And at this point it's hate and, a lot of people think that Eris did this in spite to spite Tywin and to to show him because Tywin left he said he was resigning his hand all this stuff and because of that um uh, Eris basically took his heir away from him and that pissed off Tywin more and at the same time Eris would not marry Rhaegar to Cersei so all of this stuff because it wasn't he banging Tywin's wife there are rumors and and that's part of why Eris mistrusted Tywin and Tywin mistrusted Eris because you know Tywin thinks he took that you know right of the Lord's first night or whatever with uh, Joanna Lannister, and it's up in the air whether it happened or not, and so that that kind of fed into it, and then there were people around King's Landing and around the Seven Kingdoms that were saying that Eris wasn't actually running the country, Tywin really was, and so that pissed off Eris, so that that's 
it, it just kept escalating and escalating and it it kind of surmounted in him naming jamie to the king's guard and pissing just pushing tywin over the edge he was done now right, right that's that's the key he's over the edge this this is broken his greatest ally it's it's a shit show with Worcestershire. <laughs> It's my and last then, one. Yeah, as as Ares is trying to engulf Brandon Stark in flame, he dips some Worcestershire sauce on them. So here, have some of that and that, you salty mother. <laughs> um. So, what are some of the other ulterior motives behind the tournament? Um. <laughs> uh. Okay, so I think the other main one, and we definitely got to come, got spend some time with this one, is mm. uh, the coup of Rhaegar Targaryen, the rumored coup, the rumored coup, alleged which, coup. Uh, I'm gonna lean, lend some credence to. It's it's not reasons. an insurrection, Nick. It's just it was just a friendly protest with a bunch of friendly people <laughs> hanging out at Heron Hall with a trial by combat, which I, <laughs> no one in the right mind would take that literally nobody uh, uh no one no one there there was just a tour wanted to show off heron hall to all these people just just a like a tourist group that's all it they're, was they're very good people there and yeah. they're very excited about worcestershire and because of <laughs> yes. that Walter Went had just developed this new strain of worcestershire <laughs> sauce <laughs> they, he these folks it love barbecue everyone. they love it <laughs> So he wants to bring everybody in that night at the feast. You know, a lot gets said about Robert Baratheon's drinking competition. But what you don't get is how the steak was marinated with that good Worcestershire sauce that Walter Went just developed last week. It's just fire. And I suggest you march down there to get some, but not right this second. I don't mean actually go. We're going to make a lot of people hungry for some Worcestershire sauce. We're going to have a lot of people really pissed off. I'm like, I came here to listen about a solar vice fire, and they just keep talking about barbecuing. I don't even know what to do with them. So I don't even eat meat. Don't you know I'm vegan? Right. So there was <laughs> potentially a coup going on, or or uh, the planning stages for a coup were supposed to be taking place. Supposedly going to be taking place here. Uh, Lord Varys, the Spider, had warned King Aerys that Rhaegar. Uh, who was his heiress's son and the crown prince had arranged the tournament as a pretext to meet with several of these high lords to discuss removing heiress the mad king because he's the mad king in sort of an informal great council like they were all going to get there and meet up and be like yo we got to get this guy the fuck out he keeps wanting to burn people his fingernails are long i don't know which one's worse <laughs> his pet's heads are falling off <laughs> No, he pronounces well, it Warnister sauce. Ugh, what are we gonna do, bitch? They're all just sitting there, like grinding their teeth. Well, and it's also symbolic as well. And I think that's what Varys really harped on because, you know, they were people of prophecy. Like they all kind of fell into obeying or or minding the prophecy too much. And Harrenhal was the site of the last great council. Mm-hmm. And I think meeting. You know, Rhaegar I'm, was definitely a student of prophecy. Absolutely. And the fact that the Wints couldn't afford this shit, you know Varys was just like, this broke motherfucker. He, There is no way. No way. They, I mean, they can't even repair the castle, let alone pay these purses. And I, I, I think the evidence... Well, I mean, repairing that castle is literally impossible. Nobody knows how to use the magic and build with dragon Let glass anymore. Upkeep the castle. There you they go. can't even upkeep the castle. Jesus. Well, and it's it's interesting that you say that because a lot of people in in the world believe that it was Rhaegar who was bankrolling the tournament, um, just kind of again as to get, these to get here. all these people together, right? So they could kind of start plotting this coup. Well, and alleged coup, sorry, alleged coup. We don't. There's nothing. I never said the word coup. Who said who said coup? You said coup. Now, now you're putting words into my mouth. So, uh. It's also extremely convenient, considering it's basically smack dab in the middle of the Seven Kingdoms, and it's in a time period where extremely abnormal. You know, it's the first time in two years people can actually travel, so everyone yeah, it was will, the year of the fall show spring. up, right? And 
I, I would imagine that Rhaegar would have some sort of spy network as well and would know the brewing alliance between, you know, the Tullys and the Starks and the Baratheons and who's the fourth? I think that's it. I'm pretty sure there was a fourth. Oh, John Aaron. The Aarons of the Eerie. Yes, yes, there you go. Yeah. There you go, my man. Uh, yeah, and that that was all kind of that all came together because John Aaron Foster, Eddard Stark, and Robert Baratheon they became such good friends, and then um, I think one of the Tullys was there was um, not Brendan Tully. What what's the other one? The little snivelly guy that can't get the arrow onto the funeral pyre. Uh, God, I Edmund? just had it on. No, the t- it's not Edmund. No, Ed, yeah, it is. Edmir, 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 Edmir Tully. Yeah, that, that guy. Ass. I think that he might have name. been Foster with John Aaron too. So there, there, there was this relationship building, and they had all had marriages promised to one another. And yeah, so I'm sure Rhaegar is kind of sensing that, or at least and aware of it. He he needs to move because Eris isn't strong enough to hold them off. And then it turns out that you know more stuff happens here that fuels that rather than stomping it out yeah (laughs) yeah just a bit so let's start there with what's going on with the stark children at the tournament this is kind of a a prelude to the night of the laughing tree and most of this comes from the story that mira reed tells to bran stark on their journey to the wall i believe it's in the third book uh a storm of swords i always get a clash of kings and a storm of swords mixed up which one's which uh, but it's the third book, A Storm of Swords, and they're on their journey to the wall, and Mira kind of, Bran likes getting stories told to him, so she tells him the story of the Cranig Mad Man, who is almost 100% Helen Reed. No, it is. She him. says it is. Does she? Yeah. Okay. She says my father several times. In the show? Yes. Okay. Because in the book, she doesn't. She just refers to him as the Cranig Man the whole time. Hmm. I think she refers to yeah. I'm almost positive. Then why would she tell this story? It's I'm almost positive because your it's the story her father story. told her. Like I, I right. It's assumed that it's her father the whole time. Like with everyone talking, it's assumed it's her father the whole okay, time. I'm getting buried in semantics. Like an yeah, idiot. It's, I don't think it's important. <laughs> anyway, he's on this vacation at the God's Eye. He decides to come across, see what's going on in the tournament, and like immediately gets bullied by these three like little fourteen year old squires. And uh, little he, dicks. Yeah, he was a, he was a full grown man, and the boys <laughs> are well not full grown, but he's a man, and these boys were all larger than him. And his only offensive weapon at the time was a three-pronged spear, which they just snatched right from him, throw him to the ground, and then mocked him, shoved him, and kicked him. Let's be real. They beat the shit out of this dude. He had to get some rehabilitation that night. Yeah. In the form of Lyanna Stark, the she-wolf, she shouts indignantly that Howland is her father's bannerman and these dicks need to leave him alone. So she beats (laughs) off his attackers with a turning sword. Leave him alone! And they that kid alone. <laughs> so the full grown cranning man can't handle these guys, but a little girl with a wooden sword scatters them all away. Beats Good the job shit Lyanna out Stark. of them. I mean, they're probably yeah, no, all I'm like, not trying to take it away from Leanna Stark. She's a badass, but uh, yeah, she's I, I think we need a little more out of Helen Reed here than here. Take my trident and beat the shit out of me. I would love. I mean, yeah, that is, I think this dude was just an anxious fellow. He knew how to he knew how to whoop some keister. Just a little anxious. Plus, I mean, getting beat up by a couple fifteen year olds, man, that would really do something to my confidence. I'll tell you what. Yeah, he's not a fighter. That's for damn sure. Evidenced by the fact he literally never shows up in the, sh- in the show. So the Krennic man, he is wounded, and Liana takes him back to their lair. Uh, I just did finger <laughs> quotes in case anyone underground. I did underground layer. Uh, so she cleans him up, <laughs> binds the wounds with linen, and then introduces him to her brothers, Brandon, the wild wolf, Eddard, the quiet wolf, and Benjen, the pup. Uh, and then they all go to the feast together to, like, hey, to mark hang the out? start of the tournament. Yeah, Eddard's like, dude, food. you can sleep in my, my lair tonight. I'll show you the underside of my lair. 
Liana insisted that Helen Reed is highborn and he has as much right to attend as anyone else, even though the boys who were mocking him said he didn't belong there. Uh, Liana kind of convinced him that he did. Uh, so once, once they got into Heron Hall, he kind of sat with the Starks, ate and drank with them, and just they were bros all together. He, he kind of glommed onto him. Yeah. Which I don't blame him. I've been in that spot. They got him some clothes, you know, gussing him up a little bit. They're like, come have a feast better than frog legs. Oh, yeah, definitely better than frog legs. And it's any better than frog legs. Except nah, if you got frog legs with some Worcestershire sauce on them. Oh, that shit is fire. Yeah, I don't even go. need to try it to tell you that's fire. So during the feast, uh, Prince Rhaegar, is, you know, a noted musician, he performs a sad and beautiful song that made Leanna weep. Uh, Benjen made fun of her for crying, and she pours wine over his head, which, good for her. I dick. just I keep thinking of what is it? Uh, he's from Community Kim Kim Jong. Kim yes, Jong? Kim Jong. Uh, Kim when he's Jong. like, ha, gay. <laughs> 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 I can totally see like a, a character That's like what Brandon Benjen's doing to Liana. And she just takes her cup and dumps it on his bed, <laughs> right in his face. Beats him with a tourney sword. So Helen Reed focuses attention on a Chardin and uh, who is a companion of Elia Martel, the wife of Rhaegar Targaryen, who was dancing in turns with various partners. Like we said, that was a Knight of the King's Guard, uh, Oberyn Martell, who is uh, Elia Martell's sister, so her like brother-in-law at that point, I guess. Uh, John Connington, and who is Rhaegar's right-hand man. Yeah. And and maybe, but almost definitely is in love with Rhaegar. John Connington is. I would. Yep. I think Rhaegar is a little, you know, in love with him too. Yeah, probably a little. A little bit. I think he swings both ways, and and uh, Arthur Dane too. I believe she danced with him as well. Well, it so it was a member of the King's Guard is all that said. So they're they're saying it's either Arthur Dane or Barristan Selmy. I think. It's stated, Barrison, so we it's somewhere not, it that never he danced with her. The, and the way she tells the story, it's she dances with very with three partners: first, a member of the King's Guard; secondly, a Red Snake; and third, the Lord of Griffins; and then lastly, uh, the pup, who is or not the pup, the the Quiet Wolf, uh, because they never refer to anyone by name in this. She just she uses sh- sigils and um, symbology, I guess. Yeah. to describe all of the different people throughout this story uh because a chardain is is known as a maid with laughing purple eyes uh so it, it's that never honey. stated outright that it is who who the king's guard member is there's a lot of king's guard there yes but not all of four. them because jamie got sent back yeah four instead of five well there's seven total but, uh six actually Oswell Went is a member yeah. of the King's Yard, too. There you go. So the only one not there is Jamie. Yeah. Uh, so Eddard is actually too shy to ask her to dance. Brandon asks her for Eddard, and Eddard gives her the last dance of the night. Um, and again, uh, as uh, Barrison says to Danny at one point in like the fifth book, Ashara was dishonored by one of the Starks at Heron Hall that night, too, which w- we don't know what that means. That's there's all the some, information we have on it. There's a theory. Okay. Uh, this is what I came across that I actually thought was extremely interesting. And it's that Rickard Stark, so the boy's father, mm-hmm. was a bit of a, a, a schemer. And he's kind of behind the yeah, scenes trying to put together was. this, this you know, alliance. His, his southern ambitions. Right. And mm-hmm. he knows that a quiet second son is not going to net him much of anything in a high standard family that will actually be useful to him. But he thinks that, uh, you know, Eddard could probably get with a Shara Dane and bring the Danes in an ancient house, you know, someone with a lot of prestige mm-hmm. and respect money, a solid army, get that Dorn good love infrastructure. Going on. What's that? Get that Dorn love going on. Heck yeah. Got to bring and Dorn into the fold. I mean, why not? They're they're nasty, and uh, yeah. So there's that as well. The political intrigue, and also the rumor that there was possibly a one night stand, and Eddard yes. was he got some. Uh, 
not long after this, Ashara was pregnant. Uh, she had a stillbirth and then threw herself off the top of the tower. So we don't really know what happened. <laughs> God damn. Maybe. That maybe so... that all happened. Maybe oh, it did. So you know, allegedly that that's the story that the world believes. But some people think she's still out there. I can see that some people think that like dishonor that John is that baby and she didn't have a stillbirth. Some people think Danny's that baby and she didn't have a stillbirth. Like there's a million theories about what's going on with a Chardane. Man, wouldn't that be wild? Yeah. There's 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 too many theories in this to like we could get bogged down in Game of Thrones theories all day long. Or not King of, let's call them a th- song of ice and fire theories because the Game of Thrones series were all or theories were all trash and the series played into none of them and just didn't give a shit to pay off anything that George has put a lot of thought into. He's just kind of pissed on it. Yeah. Whatever. Fuck them. Uh, so the last thing with the Starks is during this feast, uh, both Helen Reed and Lyanna recognized the three bullying squires. One served a pitchfork knife uh, which is house high one served a porcupine which is house blunt and again these are their sigils and the last boy served a knight of two towers which is house fray uh, liana points them out to her brothers benjamin off- benjin offered to find Helen a horse and armor in order to avenge himself uh, he just said nothing torn with indecision um, but his pride demanded vengeance uh, but he was afraid of losing and making himself look like a fool because he is not good on a horse or with a lance. Those aren't things that he is successful at ever. So he doesn't want to bring shame to the uh, further shame to the Cranning men by going out there and just getting his ass beat. Right. Not his style. Um, he's more of a. Uh, he's like a rogue. He's a he's a good right hand man. He'll give you good advice. He'd be a master assassin. Yeah. Uh, so before going to sleep that night uh, with Eddard, as you said, in, in Eddard's lair, the uh, <laughs> he prays, he faces the gods, I and prays to the old gods. Don't know what he says, just he said a prayer to the old gods to help Please. him avenge himself, I guess. Help me grow six inches. Yeah. In height and in the pants! So do you have anything else on what was going on with the Starks that night? Because we'll move to the next day and, and talk about that next. But I want to make sure we fully cover the Starks. I think we kind of got it all. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we covered it all. Some people also think a Chardain is living in the neck with Helen Reed now. That would be fascinating. And maybe even Mira and Jojen's mm. parents or mother that would explain a lot of the magical a bit the green sight and mm-hmm. stuff like that that is seemingly inherent in the chronic man or at least jojen's line well that and would so be, hmm. part of that theory is because mira is almost exactly the same age as john and you can't tell that from the show because kit harrington is like clearly much older than the actress that plays mira reed i i, I don't know her name sorry um but he's clearly older and they don't look anything alike, but the, the book descriptions are close enough where you could have a baby swap at some point because they're that same age. So between John and Mira, or they could be twins and Ashara and uh, Howland took one up to the neck and, and kind of kept her secret because she doesn't, Mira doesn't have any of those uh, abilities either. Only Jojen does. Right. Right. So there's, there's a lot of, of theories out there about Mira's, parentage may not be all it seems and there's all kinds of stuff that would be incredibly there are a lot of baby swaps in a song of ice and fire i mean they yeah they just handed them out like hotcakes she gets you know you get mixed up or fake out baby swaps you you don't know (laughs) all right so let's talk about the night of the laughing tree that's what we're all here for that's why everyone clicked on this episode when you talk about turning hair and hall you have to talk about the night of the laughing tree i thought it was the worcestershire well, yeah. What the fuck, man? Because at the feast, after the Night of the Laughing Tree beat these guys' asses, again, they brought out the Worcestershire sauce and just <laughs> doused everything in it and toasted. They just poured it in their glasses this time and toasted to the Night of the Laughing Tree. Took some shots. Yeah. Like, take that. That bitch. was that was the night's backup plan. If they couldn't paint the tree on their shield like they wanted to, they were just going to paint a bottle of Worcestershire sauce and be the Night of Worcestershire and cover themselves in barbecue sauce so they're just real slick. 
During the first two days of the tournament, the <laughs> Porcupine Knight, Pitchfork Knight, and the Knight of the Two Towers each won place among the champions, all in jousting. Uh, so late on the afternoon of the second day, a mystery knight appears, short of stature, into the lists. He says, what's happening? Yeah, armor, all mismatched, bits and pieces of ill-fitting armor. Uh, shield is emblazoned with the image of a white werewood with a laughing red face. And they're small. Not so very this, big. Yeah, this is important to note that earlier in her story, Mira had mentioned that the Krennic men had with him a leather shield, but does not specify whether this was the same shield with the white werewood. They don't ever mention that this one's leather. Well, and I think... So that's something important to keep in mind if you're trying to keep track of this story as we're telling it. I Honestly, I think it's just kind of a throwaway thing because... Superfluous detail because George Martin loves superfluous details? Yeah, well, not necessarily because if you think about the armament of the Cryonic Men, that is most definitely not a jousting shield that would be appropriate in a joust or no. a tilt, if you will. It'd probably be more like a buckler or a very small one-armed shield instead of the heavy, thick oak shields they use in chests. Nobody knows what you're talking about, Nick. Nobody's got that you know exactly knowledge of about. different types of shields. Get out of town. You know what I'm talking about. But if you look at it, ben, you know, Benjamin was able to get him a bunch of different shit. Easy. He got him some That's clothes. That's thinking. Right. So he's probably just like, here, here's some armor. So the Idiot. mystery knight pops up. He challenges and defeats all three of the previously mentioned knights, winning custody over their horses and armor. Um, none of these knights were particularly popular, so the small folk all cheered for the mysterious knight of the laughing tree. Everybody loves a mystery knight at a tournament. We learn that in the Duncan Egg Tales and pretty much everywhere else, anytime a mystery knight pops up. Yeah, people go wild. Like, show your boobs wild. Yeah, I it's, get it. It's weird. It's something different. Like, everybody knows what Barristan Selmy can do. We want to see what this knight with the fucking tree on their shield can do. We don't even know who this is. Well, you love to see the underdog win, too. This dude with this whack fit and, right. you know. It's really shit's... cool when George Mason makes it to the Final Four. It's not cool when Kentucky makes it to the Final Four eight years in a row. Right. Exactly. Or, like, I can't think of anything else. No, my you analogy is perfect. You don't need to. Yeah, it was pretty good. When the, so the defeated trio, they try and ransom back all their former stuff. Uh, the knight declared that his terms were that they ought to teach their rude squire some honor. And that would be ransom enough. The knight's voice sounded booming through his helm. That's very noteworthy. In any time you look at theories or anything on this, it's very noteworthy that the voice sounds booming coming through the helm. Um, right. And the the... Three knights, they proceed to chastise their squires sharply and get all their shit back. Pretty much. In what I listened to, there was uh, like some serious sound effects. Like these knights were fucking these squires up. Just absolutely nice. punishing them. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, I yeah. watched quite a few videos on this and I didn't see that. I didn't I didn't see that one. It was funny. It was like, <laughs> and just, you know, a bunch of fucking swords clanging and kids going, ah. Very odd. I so know this drew a lot of subjects. unwanted attraction to the Mystery Knight. Robert Baratheon and Richard Lonmouth were very determined to unmask him. And this kind of just continued their drinking competition from the night before. They're like, fuck it. Now whoever finds this knight is the best. Um, King Ares was certain that whoever the knight was, was an enemy to him. So he convinced, uh, he was convinced that the tree on the Mystery Knight, Knight's shield was actually laughing at him. Uh, he the thought gods. Yeah, he thought that it was probably Jamie Lannister who was pissed off and returned to the tourney against the king's wishes and just defying his orders to protect Rayla and Viserys in King's Landing because he was like, fuck it, I came here to play and you sent me home, bitch. I'm trying to see them titties. I'm trying to win this shit. <laughs> I don't... I don't think Jamie as the the Knight of the Laughing Tree is a very uh, the widely held theory of, of who it actually is. I don't think it holds a lot of stake because I feel like that's something Jamie would have mentioned at some point. Jamie, Jamie, uh, yeah, especially after boisterous. Ares is dead, right? Too boisterous. There's, there's no reason to keep that a secret. As soon as Ares is dead and he's sitting on the throne and Ned walks in and, you know, he tells him to get off the throne or whatever. 
Jamie would be like, oh, yeah. And I was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. So, dude. He, he wouldn't keep that to himself because the only reason, too, is while Eris is alive and Eris is pissed. And once that's over, there, there's no reason anymore. And also, like, I think in that moment where he's, you know, he admits to Brienne how he killed King Ares. This seems like a much smaller offense that might be thrown in there as well, you know? Right. I got back at him this one time. It we, was we sick. We see too much inside of Jamie's head to not know that it was him if it were him. I I just don't think it lines up. As a 15-year-old yeah. idealistic, you know, I'm going to stick it to my dad and be the youngest Kingsguard And he was history. proud to be a Kingsguard. Right. I think he's going to follow his first order, mm-hmm. which is to literally the first order after his coronation, which is to go back to King's Landing and guard the wife and the son or daughter <clears throat> well so in another part about this is when Ares gets home 10 days later he's asking Rayella and Viserys how long Jamie's been there right mm-hmm. he's gonna say hey did Jamie get here 10 days ago or did he get here 8 days ago and they're gonna know whether when he got there and be able to kind of corroborate that so Ares is mad in the moment but I don't think that carried over anywhere because he ca- like and and if they say oh he got here seven days ago he's killing Jamie immediately yeah yeah there's no you know so Jamie I don't think there was any bad blood cruelty. after Ares got back which would lend credence to Jamie was actually that person right plus I don't think he thought very highly of Jamie and after he sent Rhaegar after you know the night of the laughing tree or two. I think he would think Rhaegar would be able to figure Jamie out or outwit him or track him down or, or something of that nature, you know? Mm-hmm. And he, he came up short. Yeah. So what we're saying is Ares is crazy and we don't agree with him. He's rude. Speaking of rude, he fiercely commanded all of his own knights to find and defeat the Knight of the Laughing Tree uh, when the joust resumed the next morning, but the Knight of the Laughing Tree never came back. Didn't they only find his shield? Yeah, so, again, Eris is angered, sends everybody out to go looking for him. This traitor will not show his face, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, all his men, including Rhaegar, go out to search for the Vanished Knight, but only the shield could be found abandoned in a tree nearby. Yeah, I mean, that's slick. Yeah. So, Mira claims at the beginning of the story that the Knight of the Laughing Tree may have actually been the Krennic Man, the Krennic Man, uh, but there are a lot of other theories out there too, which we'll kind of flesh out in in the final part of this this episode. Um, and Jojen is not so sure that it's the Craneman. Like his the first thing he says when she starts telling the story is, "I wouldn't be so sure about that, Mira." I have thoughts. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna get to it before we get to who we think it is. I want to point out the. I think the most notable things that happen in the story that point to potentially who the Knight of the Laughing Tree could be, because there's a lot of clues about the identity. So the mystery knight must have been someone who knew about Helen Reed's experience with the squires and was motivated to avenge him. Right. Because that's that they go after those three and then just peace out after that. Um, So that points to the Stark siblings or Helen Reed himself. uh, But the, the books don't mention anyone else noticing the incident other than the five of them. Um, His height is below average or else it wouldn't be noted in the first place that he was short of stature. Uh, The mismatch armor would point to the knight not having access to regular armor or having regular armor with kind of telltale markings on it. So he'd be easily identified if he wore his own armor. Uh, The booming voice was most likely not the regular voice of the knight. That's why again, it's pointed out that he spoke in a booming voice uh, and the Werewood image implies some connection to the old gods in the north. Again, that goes back to the Reeds and the Starks. He's competent enough at the Joust to defeat three knights who had made it through the first day of the tourney, but as none of them were particularly well known, he need not have been super skilled. And then Mira is surprised that Bran had never heard the story before, which suggests that the knight may have either been a Stark or someone close to the family, like Helen Reed again, or just she's under the impression that this would be a stark family legend kind of thing going on and and i could get that even from the first half of the story of the of the night before with liana saving howland and all the other things going on it, it doesn't necessarily deal. point to the the night being 
one of one of the Starks, it could just be like this should be an important story with the Starks. But I think it's important that Bran had never heard the story, and, and we'll absolutely put a pin on that point. Well, I think she associated it with the closeness between the Kranich men and the Starks, mm-hmm. and would assume that you know, like Howland obviously looks up well, to the, the Starks. Yeah, I think this whole way. event is what brought Ned and Howland together to be so close. Like Howland is one of Ned's most trusted advisors. He goes with Ned to the Tower of Joy uh, when I mean, he saves Ned's life. Exactly. And and so that that all blossomed here. So regardless of if the Night of the Laughing Tree is a Stark or not, it is an important story in the Stark's past that builds th- this friendship with the Reeds. And it, 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 because even if even if this didn't do it, then the Tower of Joy shows that that relationship between the Reeds and the the Starks as well. And you would think that that would be a Stark story of of. Ned going there and how Helen saved him, but Ned is always plays things close to the chest and you know not very outspoken about these types of things. So it is surprising to Mira that that the Starks have never heard any of these stories, which I find weird because she specifically mentions. I'm pretty sure that that's all her dad would say about it. Like he wouldn't say much about the situation or what went down. Right. Yeah. She outside she of this like base story. Yep. So, who won the tournament now that the Night of the Laughing Tree is gone? We got a couple events. The melee was won by Lord Robert Baratheon, who won the seven-sided melee and unhorsed many knights in the process. Yeah, he was out here killing He's got that it. battle hammer, bitches. I mean, what is he, 6'5 in the books? Like 280? Yeah, he's a beast. He's, he's, he's LeBron he's like James. A, yeah, he, he's a fucking linebacker. He's not... Uh, like this big fat guy like they portray him in the show and well he kind of became fatter as he was king and, and got lazy and he wasn't in fighting shape anymore but in, in his youth during Robert's Rebellion and um, the Iron Islands Rebellion like he, he was a monster he was like the guy that plays the mountain yes basically in, in that story so what happened at the joust Nick the joust which is what we're all so, here for yeah i mean Rhaegar targaryen was out here slaying it he defeated yon royce then unhorsed to brandon stark who was in you know the semifinals basically he's right there um and then sir arthur dane and then proceeded to unseat barristan selmy and this is where i'll talk about it because it. there was the rumor that you know the understanding that people were kind of throwing matches to yeah. Rhaegar Targaryen, and he wasn't known for his his jousting skills. Like he was known as a, a fantastic swordsman, you know, a beautiful tactician and stuff like that, but not necessarily a like uh, Howland Reed. You know, it just wasn't really his style. But if you look at it, Brandon Stark would absolutely want to unseat Rhaegar. There's no doubt a fucking about it. And the way Barristan Selmy describes it, because he he details it to uh, Dan, Danny, I believe, yep. um, that, you know, Rhaegar just beat him. Like, I don't think, you know, 3,000 miles away with a, a talking about a person that's been dead for 20 years, I don't think Barristan Selmy would have a reason to lie about the fact that he tried. You know Right, what I mean? and this is, it's not prime Barristan Selmy. But it's it's subprime. He's right there. It, it's just on the he's he's just starting to come down the hill. He's not well, what right. we see in in the main storyline of, of how old he is. Well, the fact that he is a Kingsguard, you know, some could argue that that's why he would throw the match. But if you, you know, Rhaegar's well, not the king. He is the prince. Well, but they're still the, not supposed to hurt. He's the crown prince. He's next in line. They're not supposed to hurt anyone in the royal family absolutely they're supposed to defend him with their lives but i think growing up raising Rhaegar, basically teaching him most of everything he knows in combat you'd have that closeness with him that it would be they've done this a thousand times mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense nice. and, so, and so as Rhaegar wins he gets to name the, the new queen of love and beauty and instead he passes on his beautiful wife ellie martell of dorne 
and gives the crown of blue winter roses to none other than Lyanna Stark. Uh, she is chosen as the queen of love and beauty, and kind of this ignites a scandal around all of this because, again, he's already married to Elia, and Lyanna is betrothed to Robert Baratheon, and Robert Baratheon is very smitten. He with loses Lyanna. his shit. Yeah, <laughs> let's be real. He loses his shit. Her emails. Lyanna's emails. emails. He kept talking about Worcestershire sauce. I know that's something sexual. I need to see it. She so, said she wants to put Worcestershire sauce on his ass and lick it off. What does that mean? <laughs> I heard her told her. I already told her I eat ass. Does she need more? <laughs> the fuck? I got a bigger ass than he does. Come on. <laughs> I said on the ass, not in the ass, Nick. <laughs> Oh, shit. Um, yeah, this is kind of a twofold. This is where I'm. I get lost. Specifically, the the machinations behind why he would do this. All right, so let's talk about it. And the only way to talk about that is to talk about what would you do? Who do we think the Knight of the Laughing Tree actually was? This is when we're going to talk about it. Uh, should we just list the popular theories first and then kind of talk about who we actually think it is? Oh, sure. We can do okay. that. Like, so it's a short list. It is a short list. There, uh, These are all of the ones that I've ever heard mentioned. Jamie Lannister, which we've already kind of debunked that one. Howland Reed. Brandon Stark. Eddard Stark. Benjamin Stark. Lyanna Stark. Ashara Dane. And um, Time Traveling Bran. That was a new one I heard. Dumb. Yeah, that, Fuck that one's bad. I want to talk about Let's talk about that one for a minute because it's so dumb. So uh. the, the theory is because Helen prayed to the old gods on the god's eye, Bran in the future when we see him now sees Howland and in the same way he possessed Hodor, possesses Howland and becomes a knight for a day basically and fights with the strength, uh, fights with the, the knowledge of someone who was trained on horse and lance. Uh, but in the body of Helen Reed. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he, he hodors but him, Brand but he doesn't fuck up his brain. Too. So it must be, be at least his second try, because he knows how he fucked up Hodor, so now he tries it again with somebody different and doesn't fuck up Helen. Too convoluted. Very convoluted, and I don't like that... Um, I don't like Brand time travels and does everything. It's not narratively compelling at all. It's very, very dumb. It's just, if, if we keep, for the next two books, if they ever come out, if every, thing, if every secret that we've been, you know, plotting over for the past, well, just for me it's it. been 10 oh, years, no, but no, for no. a lot of people it's been over 20 years, if that all c- turns out to be, yeah, Bran did it. Well, yeah, Bran did this too. Yeah, Bran did this. So the last two books are just all Bran chapters about how he time travels back and does everything we've already seen. That's not fun. Well, and when you think about it, there's many a way that he could, if he could try and time travel and overtake Howland Reed to defeat three people in a joust, I think he could just time travel into the fucking, you know, bedpan changer for the king and just slit his fucking throat and be done with it. Well, but so that's the problem, though. It's a time loop. He can only do things that he's already done. So he can't, he can't change anything in the past. He can just go back and do the things that are, have already been done in the past. Yeah, it's I like the like time that. turner in Harry Potter. Yeah. No, too convoluted. But yeah, it, it, I don't think we're going to deal a lot with time travel. I think I think Bran's big reveal of his powers and his abilities to actually affect the past are going to all fall on Hodor. Bec- and, and I think that is going to scare him enough to not continue to do it. Right? Right. Hodor was this dude. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about Brandon Stark. Who I also no. don't think it was. Do you think it was Brandon Stark? No, I think Brandon Stark's too big. He's too, too big, noticeable. and he's already in the tournament. Right. Absolutely. So why do you need to? Why do you need to come in as a mystery knight and as yourself? Like just just challenge those guys and and beat them anyways. And I imagine that. Well, he does have an association with the old gods. I would imagine that there's got to be some kind of jousting going on. There's got to be multiple jousts going on at the same time. Just like on NFL Sunday, there's right. always multiple games. So he can't be games. out jousting those motherfuckers and be over in his actual 
lineup that he's supposed to be in. Right. Physically, I just don't think the dude can no. handle it because you're in the Riverlands. It's hot. You know. I agree. It's not Brandon tight. Stark, bad idea. How about Eddard Stark? Also don't think so no. because Eddard Stark was known to not be necessarily dope with the lance. That was not his his it's, forte. It's long that, range weapon. Uh, I think he's probably also too big. He's fifteen at the time, but I think he's probably still too big. He he's I a just, he's a solid dude. He he wouldn't nobody would call him short in stature, I don't think, at any point. And the laughing tree is not his style. He's not one to mock people openly, you know? Well, also, he is a Stark and proud. I don't think he would substitute his sigil for anything. No, and, and that so that's the other thing is he's 15. He could just have entered if he wanted to. I mean, he can just right. say, hey, I, I want to come in. There's no reason for him to hide. So it's got to be somebody with a reason to hide, which... Uh, so let's talk about Benjen Stark. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, really? This is my pick. All right, so let's hold that then. Let's talk about who it's not, because I have a different pick. Uh, okay. Let's talk about Ashara Dane. Nay. Nay. <laughs> no. I do I, think the Danes are, are, are house trained in combat, but I think Ashara is more of a, a whisperer. She is definitely not. She's very slight. She's uh, a court woman. And I think the booming voice thing, I think you can tell it's a there's a huge difference between like a 12 13 year old trying to sound like a man and a full grown woman well she's not full grown she's 15 even okay yeah. a young woman trying to well, sound like a man i'm going to disagree with you on on that point and and i'll i'll come back to it f- further later but i i ashara's not a big enough part of the story she didn't see what happened to howlin and let, so the only way she knows is if ned tells her when they're dancing but ned's the shy wolf if they talk about anything during that dance, it's not going to be about how Helen got his ass kicked earlier that night, right? So that's right, strike like one. My homie over there, you know, he got uh, his ass whooped. You should give him a kiss. Strike two is that it 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 doesn't make any narrative sense to be her. Like, what's the payoff for that if we learn in book seven that it was Ashara Dane and she's dead to the world, right? It it doesn't mean anything. I think the Danes and Ashara Dane play a big role in things that happen at the tower of joy and whatever this dishonor that barristan selmy talks about but i i don't think there's any reason for her to be jousting at this time well let's be real here she has she no most connection likely, to the starks well she most likely wouldn't have any training in the first place because if you look at the generation after this if you look at Arya, i mean even ned was reluctant to train her you well, had to but, do that in secret basically but so here, here's to... the argument is she's from Dorne where women and men are, are trained as equals if women choose to be right in an ancient house and stuff like that but they're also still trying to stay relevant in the courts and they have a knight of the king's guard in the family yeah I don't you know? I don't and is and so that's the other thing right if it's if it's a if it's a Shara and she's pissed off on Ned's behalf on Helen's behalf she's just going to tell Arthur Dane to go kick their ass she's not going to go out there and do it uh, he didn't and, even have to kick their ass. He just has to walk over and be like, "Yo, yeah, exactly." You're fucking. And up. she has. So the other problem with her is she has no connection to the old gods. Why is she painting a werewood on her shield? Right. That doesn't make sense. I mean, that would be the ultimate throw up, throw you off type deal. I, I but guess. I agree. But I you, agree you could pick anything to throw somebody off. You could throw, you know, a bottle of Worcestershire on there. Exactly. People would just be like, "What is that? That looks incredibly delicious." All right, so the last one that neither of us buy into is actual Howland Reed rather than time traveling Bran in Howland Reed. Actual Howland Reed, he's my number two pick. He's he's also my number two pick. Um, I I I don't think you just get good overnight, good enough to beat three trained knights with lance and and horse. I unless there's I some magic going on. Well, I think he's got a couple things working for him, specifically. If you think about his choice of weapon, his trident, I mm-hmm. mean, that is a long-range weapon that requires extreme precision and body control. But it works and a lot different than a lance. It, it does work a lot different than a lance, but it's like still a lot You don't see Aquaman clo- out there jousting. Yeah, but it's a lot closer to a lance than a sword, which yeah. is what most of these people are currently, you know, good with. And at the same time, if you – you got to look back deep – it's a deep cut of A Song of Ice and Fire, but the details of the Cranic Maiden's combat style <clears throat> really well, leads to warfare. a lot of... 
Right. Real, well, it really leads to a lot of lower body strength. If you think of like, I think guerrilla warfare is an extension. I feel like in jousting, you need upper body strength. You got to thrust with that arm. How do you hold on to the, the damn horse? Really, yeah, it's but that's holding just horse on to the horse with your legs. Yeah. Think of who the best horse riders in the world ever, in our world, ever were, know. for an analogy. How would I know? The Mongolians, because everyone knows that, Calvin. So if you look at that, the Mongolians All I know were is about also, Worcestershire sauce. Did the Mongolians eat Worcestershire sauce? No. You're goddamn right. They pickled lungs and shit and ears in Worcestershire, and they fucking threw that on the grill, sizzled it up, homeboy. That's how Genghis Khan took the world. But they were also some of the best guerrilla tacticians in all of human history. And I think George is a student of human history to a he certain definitely extent. Is. I am not. G- get good, Calvin. Shit. Not at history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, throw- I'm throwing a lot in there not because I think George ties most of his his ideas to, like, you know, Actual the War of the Roses. Events. Yeah, I, right. no, I, I 100% agree with you there. I just... I just don't think he he was never trained to ride a horse. He's never trained to use a lance. And all of a sudden he's beating three knights that won their competitions on the first day. I don't see it happening. And, you know, a lot of people will point to, well, he prayed to the old gods. Maybe the old gods provide him strength. There was another theory that I'm not even going to go into detail on this one, that a uh, one of the green men from the Isle of Faces came over and, and, and fought it for his honor. Uh, dumb. Yeah. I Dumb. I don't like that either. I, I don't see the point in that. And I, I also think that the payoff doesn't matter if it's Howland Reed. The only other thing is he's never mentioned again. And that's when Howland just stops talking about it. So, yeah, that's that's also curious. But neither is Benjamin Stark. So, yeah. OK, let's talk about Benjamin. Why do you think it's Benjamin? Uh, a multitude of things we've already mentioned. He's not in the tournament. He's just kind no, of... No, he's too young. He's, he's right. like nine at the time. He's just kind of there. And I think a mismatched piece of, you know, armor... You could probably find a small suit of armor for like a smaller dude. Well, he had you know, armor because he, he offered to give his armor to Howland so Howland could defend himself. But he can't wear... His, if, if it's Benjen, he can't wear his armor because it's clearly Stark armor. Right. So I think you can mismatch things, but it'd be a lot harder to find a consistent suit of armor when you're a boy with mismatched proportions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you You got to find a lot of of other small people that'll loan you things. Well, just, you know, or you have as training gear in your caravan. That's kind of where I think this whole thing all came from. That makes sense. Is within the caravan of the Starks because, you know, they're... Does Ned compete? No, he doesn't no. compete. So you have Benjen, who is com- or not Benjen, but Brandon, who is competing. So naturally, you would have a excess. I'm sure of they all bring their stuff armament. because there's little like I'm sure there's little like toy jousting Photo and shit for kids to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I th- he's also been you know he's a noble. He's been trained on the horse, mm-hmm. the lance, the sword, probably the bow and arrow. You know all these things. So he's got a rudimentary knowledge of it at least maybe enough to unseat three squires of the south because he's a northman Mm -hmm. and i mean i think it would just be but he's he's probably stronger by by being a northman is that what you're trying to say i think yeah i think benjen's benjen is a a unique specimen especially because he succeeds so within the night's watch so far in the north he's the first ranger he's the baddest motherfucker on the planet basically great horse rider I honestly I think it was just his brothers taking a piss and talking him into it you know he's nine he wants to be cool he wants to be like his oldest brother I think that would be the easiest situation but the only thing that bothers me is if it is Benjen where did the rest of the armor go and I, I kind of come to the conclusion that uh, he well, but if it's it anybody where did Howland? the rest of the armor go Right. Well, I think Benjen did it, passed that, the armor off to Howland, who left. Like, I think he just, he bounced. Well, it could be, but I was... mean, if if it's like you said, they've got this rolling armory kind of thing that, that goes down to the tournament with them. He, so the shield is found the next day. So right, near, on nearby. Day, right, on day two, when he enters the list, whoever the knight is enters the list, fights all day. If, if it's a Stark and they, they take that armor from the rolling armory, that night, they, they put it back in the rolling armory and then just go leave. The, then the next day when everyone's looking for him, they go leave the shield by the tree. 
that you know because wh who, whoever it ends up being the armor's gone no matter what but i i just i don't think Benjamin would be able to leave the camp especially with all these camp aides that's why you know it, it kind of makes sense that howland would be the one to to sneak this shit away plus he's a chronic man carrying a, a shield that shit's heavy just toss it and dip i i don't i think you're making too much out of the the armor situation but uh my oh that, that's what i'm making too much out of. my theory is that it was almost definitely Lyanna stark you've and, said this many a time yes. but i just and i've, I, I've, I've never gone back to disagree on it. let me let me lay it out i let you lay out your your benjamin nonsense let me lay out why Lyanna stark is actually it okay I, I i think liana's i mean you've already had me at liana so let's start with that ned is very very fond of liana for every single re he was he was fond of her before she died and then everything happened at the tower of joy and promised me and all of that and so he holds on to this fondness and i think that's a big part of the reason why mira thought it was odd that bran had never heard the story because you would think ned she would think ned would want to brag about this great thing his dead sister did but if you're ned he pretty much just never wants to talk about anything liana did ever um the small stature another big factor uh you know howland's also small benjamin's also small but howland says he's not good with horses and there's there's not a lot of other things pointing directly to benjamin um so how Hall howland gets ruled out we're still down to benjamin liana um liana is very good at riding horses and she's practiced with a lance especially for a woman she's very good at these things um she trained she's constantly compared to aria throughout the story anytime ned thinks back on liana or he's watching aria he thinks back on liana and it's it we're meant to draw this comparison between aria and liana anytime aria is doing something aria ish right right so Liana was very much the same type of person and she was actually trained on horse and with Lance and she practiced with her brothers and, and did all this other stuff. So the mismatch armor is another big hint. One, obviously she doesn't have her own armor for all the reasons that should be obvious here because she's a woman, because she's too young, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it also, having mismatch armor will also help her hide any womanly features that might be blossoming at this time. Um, I think the booming voice, another huge indicating factor here, uh, because it a, a man other than Benjamin, a man would have no reason to hide his voice in this situation. No, nobody knows anybody by their voice unless they're like best buds. Um, so I'm thinking if it's Howland or Brandon or Ned, that they wouldn't be that concerned with being found out because they're allowed to be there. You know, they're allowed to to be jousting if they want to be so who cares if they find out who i am but for liana the if she's found out as as this mystery knight the whole stark family could lose a lot in this world um by actively participating in a tournament as a woman and she doesn't want to bring that on her family and she knows all of that goes into this so she has to keep hiding herself the worst that happened like benjen wouldn't cause this great dishonor on his family if he's found out to be the knight but liana could and that could be very bad for them it could be bad for all these southern ambitions that rickard stark has um and there's one more thing but i want to save it for the next point here and i think it's going to bury the the nail in the coffin for you when we get to it yeah i'm stuck on one thing what let's hear it where'd the <sighs> armor go no, I just don't. I feel like she would be beat to shit if she's. She would. She took all the the squires out with a tourney sword. That yeah, like Jesse that's what they're setting up different. is that she is fully capable of handling her shit. I'm not saying she's not capable. What I'm saying is you that this did. is a physical act. What's that? I said you literally just did. No, I'm saying that she would be beat to shit in a jousting match. You think three jousts in a row she wouldn't have a mark on her? That shit would hurt. We don't know and because the story ends. Well, we no, don't. We don't hear Ned center... thinking. We don't ever hear Ned thinking of it. 
Well, she's still the center of attention when, you know, Rhaegar dumps flowers on her lap. Yeah, they, they wear all these long, flowing dresses. The only thing anyone can see in these medieval times is someone's face anyways. She's not going to have marks on her face. You think a motherfucker getting, going in three lancing matches isn't going to walk with a bit of a limp? Nobody's or just walking, like, walking her limp. What? Oh Nobody's my God. walking. Watching her This walk. is a hot chick, Calvin, at a tourney with a bunch of dudes. Of course they're watching her. But there were Come hotter on, chicks around. Ellie Martell's there. Rhaegar's there. A lot Whom of good-looking have... <laughs> ass to look at. I mean, they might have a chance with Rhaegar. Probably no one else, though. Okay, so let's talk about... No, because I'll, I'll come back to Leon in a second. But what events do you think were directly a result of the events of the, the Turn of Hair? What that we learn about later in the story directly resulted from whatever happened at the tournament at Heron Hall. All of it? Yeah. That's pretty much I it. Think, I think the two biggest things were it's obviously the start or the seed of Robert's Rebellion mm-hmm. and I think it's the seed well, of Rickard's Tyler out Lannister. there champagne and campaigning. Don't He's doubt that He's Rickard to... Stark is not out there rubbing elbows. But you, you better believe it. He's burying all his kids off. He's, you know, he's keeping his nose clean. He's gathering power. But I also think it was without Tywin Lannister turning on the Mad King, I'm not necessarily positive that it, it would have turned into such a pretty transition of power. You know, it, it would well, have yeah, lasted a lot I think there's a lot, a lot of dominoes that, that fell to, to get here. And this, was, this wasn't this was even the last domino. This was the, like, fifth to last domino. It was a big fucking domino, though. It was. So the last domino, and this is a, a, a this is where I'm going to come back to it, is so when winter returned at the coming of the new year, 282 AC, mere days before the planned wedding of Brandon Stark to Catelyn Tully at River Run, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen and six confidants abducted Brandon's sister, heavy air quotes, abducted Brandon's sister, Lyanna Stark, less than 10 leagues from Harrenhal. So this is where I go back to Lyanna is the Night of the Laughing Tree. All signs point to the fact that Lyanna was not, quote-unquote, abducted, but rather she went willingly. And the only contact that we know Rhaegar and Lyanna had before this is she cried at his singing. I don't... So, Lyanna has no reason to be at Heron Hall two years later, unless she's specifically going there to meet up with somebody... And Rhaegar doesn't need to bring seven, six people with him to kidnap a 16-year-old girl, right? And, right, and if you were kidnapping a 16-year-old girl, you wouldn't want six people with you. You'd want to keep that shit on the down low. So it's, it's, it's very widely believed that she was not abducted and that they were in a loving relationship and they agreed to go away together. So it's my belief and many, many other people's beliefs that Rhaegar actually discovered who the Knight of the Laughing Tree was when he went out looking for the knight and the knight originally disappeared. Um, Rhaegar had unmasked the Knight of the Laughing Tree and found out it was Lyanna Stark. They bond at that point. He's out there. He finds her by the tree. They have this bond. They have this connection. She tells him why she did it. He loves, he likes her chivalry. She loves how beauty he is and how beautiful he is and his immaculate singing voice. So they form this bond and they make a plan to meet back at Heron Hall at a specific time, obviously two years later, and run away together. And I don't know about that. That's a long fucking time for some teenagers. Is it? Yeah, though? maybe in two years. It would take them, it would take two years for Liana to travel back to the north and back to Heron Hall, anyways. Yeah, uh, no, it's like a two week journey. Yeah, I mean, I could see Liana's infatuation with Rhaegar being something you know to that extent, well, so, but not the other way around. So here's here's Rhaegar's thing, and this is where he goes back to he's a student of prophecy. Is he had this idea that he was going to birth the next dragons, and he was the rightful heir to the throne, and he's Azor High, and all this other stuff. He believes these prophecies are about himself, and the dragon has three heads. He needs to have three kids. Um, Ellie Martell is not producing. She's sickly. She's not producing the children that she has. And there's something about Liana that he believes will help fulfill the prophecy. She is ice. He is fire. So that's why he gets hung up on her. He, it's, it's not fierce, right? It's, 
he's playing into this prophecy in his head and he thinks Liana is the only one that can help him reach the prophecy. She's infatuated because he's just super bang. Dreamy. Yeah. yeah he's dreamy. dreamy. And, and so they, he discovers her, they make this plan and they, they meet back up and they go away willingly because how else do, if, if that doesn't happen, how else does she go away willingly? How else did, how else does she end up marrying him and having a, a child through love with him? You know, what, that's what makes what happens at the Tower of Joy so tragic and, and why it's important for Ned to promise Liana that she won't tell what's going that he won't tell what's going on because if it's just this is Rhaegar's bastard, then that's not as much of a moral conundrum of this is a child made out of love. It's Liana's child, not this rape baby that should never be seen again, right? That's How does fair. that happen if they've never actually met before he abducts her? And how does he know she's going to be at Harrenhal two years later when he goes there with his six men? Ravens, I guess. I I I think ravens. that that to me that that's what had to have happened is Rhaegar had to discover her. That's why he names her the Queen of Love and Beauty. Again, why does he do that? He's never seen her before. If he's never seen her before, he crowns her. The queen of love and beauty if he did if she wasn't the the laughing tree and he didn't meet her before returning with that shield say that again so he crowns her queen of love and beauty right mm -hmm. but if she's not the knight of the laughing tree then he's never seen liana stark before he's never spoken to her why does he pass up his wife to give her the crown if like in why does he pass up his wife, Elia Martell, to give her the crown to this woman he's never seen before? If he hasn't ever seen her before. So he had to have seen her. He had to have talked to her. This is her trophy because she couldn't win a trophy for beating those three knights as the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And she had to disappear because she's a woman and can't be discovered and knows if she returns, she'll be discovered by Ares because he's going crazy. This is his way of giving her that trophy she deserves and, and okay, giving honestly, her the the props for doing what she did. Recognizing her. Yes, honestly, like, that's that's the first thing you've said that's actually pulled me towards your side. I was getting there. That's I mean, I, I understand your you know, it's a lot of it's conjecture and stuff like that, but that makes sense. If you want to notice a, a fierce woman, you know in front of everybody that's like the ultimate symbol right. sign of respect and he and elia had a very open relationship i in my mind i see him talking to elia about it and like so he's not dishonoring elia he's like look i found out this girl was something special i've got to give her this crown sorry you're my boo but it belongs to her we can still fuck but yeah you know she we still gotta make that I, third dragon head i love her yeah not you sorry well i don't even i don't even think it was the love at that point i think it was just this is my way of recognizing your skill and what you did to defend your bannermen and to put these stupid squires in their place and i think you're really hot and yeah and i want to bang this bone uh so everything at the turn of the heron hall again leads right into robert's rebellion um pretty well Hall didn't lead right into Robert's Rebellion, but the abduction of Lyanna led to Robert's Rebellion directly. And the, the, if we're going with Lyanna as the Knight of the Laughing Tree, or if any, like, Rhaegar had to have met her at Hall, so to want to abduct her, it had to come from that, and he gave her the crown either way. So his brain's ticking at that point of, like, I have to have her. So it leads to her... Turn at Hall leads to her abduction, which leads to Robert's Rebellion. And as you said the turning at Heron Hall led to pretty much the entire story of ice and fire as we know it. And I really want to see George or someone that gets a hold of his notes after he dies, finish these books so we can learn what really happened, why it happened and how far reaching the impact was, because it's all, like you said, it's all conjecture right now. If we think this led to this, which led to this, but maybe it didn't. Maybe it was one of the green man came over green man, come over from the Isle of Faces and fought for Howland. And at which point so it doesn't pissed. matter anymore. I'd be so pissed. Maybe it is time traveling, Bran. But like I, I don't think those things matter. I think the biggest impact is Lyanna Stark. 
I'm I you you kind of got me on Benjen a little bit though too because Benjen has a lot of secrets. He's a secretive cat, and that I mean I think that he has a lot of secrets, and I think that's a big reason why he went and joined the Night's Watch. Also, he's the third son in the North; like he has nothing. Um, well, you also can't be persecuted for any crimes. Exactly. I think I think he knows what went on with the Night of the Laughing Tree. If it wasn't directly him, I think he knows what happened at the Tower of Joy. I think he knows what happened between um, Rhaegar and Lyanna leading up to the Tower of Joy, because I, I think he was a close confidant of Lyanna's also. So I, I think there's a lot that Benjen knows that we never got to figure out before he disappeared. And, uh, you know, him being the Knight of the Laughing Tree would kind of have that same type of payoff of we never got to see all of this because he disappeared as we don't get to see this because Leon is dead. So I, I could see either of those having the impact it needs to have. I don't think Helen Reed or any of these other people have the impact that Liana or Benjen would have. I would like to refrain from making that statement until the final books come out, well, if they ever come out. I think the crowning men... I've always looked at them with a little more significance than they've been given. I I, I think the Krennic Men and Helen Reed have significance. That that wasn't what I was saying. Helen Reed being the Knight of the Laughing Tree, I don't think would have any narrative payoff. Because yeah. then he just defended himself. How does that build his bond with the Starks? I think one That's of the Starks point. had to defend him that made him want to follow the Starks so closely after that. And that well, brings I think Liana that, defending him in the first place, right? If it's if it's Liana defending him, then that gives him a reason that he's not there for Ned at the Tower of Joy. He's there for Liana because, for all he knows, she's been abducted, and he wants to help save her in the same way she saved him one time. That's a great fucking point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, Calvin. It just takes me a while to, to get there. You gotta let statement. me spin. No, no, no. You've 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 you know slapped down every other thing i've had to say not in a uh shitty way but you can't even tumble very on this good bitch. Point. yeah no 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 i almost picked him last week for nba centers i don't look too easy. the dream instead yeah i just like the finger wag i don't know that i like anything else about matumbo's game he's a goofy ass player to watch but that's not what we're talking about at all if you want more on no. nba centers listen to last week's episode yeah do you have anything else that we need to say that needs to be said about the tourney of Heron Hall? I honestly don't. I cannot believe I talked for an hour and a half about it, but I'm pumped. Yeah, we did good. Well, I mean, we had a lot of references to Worcestershire sauce in there, too. So that, that took up probably 20 minutes out of this whole thing. At least. All the Worcestershire. That's Worcestershire. I mean, <laughs> that's our shit. Uh, I, I, the last thing I want to say is that I'm not very happy that the sh and I, I alluded to this that the show has left this aspect of the overall story mostly Dude, out for some reason and it's probably one of the single most impactful events in fake history it's i would say it's like the catalyst to the entire story mm -hmm. of game of thrones and they made it the tower of joy is the catalyst which it is but what's the catalyst to that and and i think this tell the the turn at Heron Hall and the Night of the Laughing Tree tells a deeper story of what's behind Rhaegar and Lyanna, more so than just, well, they were at this tower together and Ned tried to save them, and then she right. died, while Rhaegar was off fighting Robert Baratheon. Hey, that doesn't mean it. Ned had a baby. Yeah. If you liked this talk about a Song of Ice and Fire, we have done four other real episodes and a series of season eight recaps please try not to subject yourself to that again we we tried to make the best of it while we were going through it uh they're called <laughs> warg it to so me they're all in like may of 2019 you can listen to them if you really want to recap season eight with us um but for actual episodes we did episode 46 a podcast about jamie lannister that was in january 2019 episode 56 was a podcast about the books versus the show and that was April of 2019. Uh, and that was kind of right before season five was about to, or season eight, sorry, was about to start. Uh, episode 99 was about a podcast about the Crypts of Winterfell. That was, that was probably my most fun, I think. I, I really like really Jamie Lannister. I that. What's that? I said that was really fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I liked talking about Jamie Lannister because Jamie Lannister is super interesting, but the Crypts was, was a lot of fun to learn more about those. That was in March of 2020. And then episode 142 
Uh, we talked about Dragons and Dragon Riders. That was in February of 2021. So we got a lot of Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones content out there if you like those things and you like this conversation we had about the tournament at Heron Hall, which this was another great conversation too. This was this, this, was. Been, this is probably number three on my list. Probably Crips of Winterfell, Jamie Lannister, this one, Dragons, books for show. We need to put this on Wikipedia so everyone can know our yeah. astute knowledge. Exactly. Thank you for listening, as always, to a podcast about something. You can uh, buy merch and follow us on Twitter from the links below. The Twitter links, uh, the Twitter addresses are at APA something and at alone underscore podcast. Uh, also, be sure to follow my new show at Magic Three TV Pod. Uh, that's going to be the magic number is three when it comes to TV. We're starting that in just two months. It's coming soon. Oh shit. That'll be a lot of fun. And check out everything from Nick and the You Are All Alone podcast at alonepodcast.com. A lot of great stuff going on out there. And thank you always to those cats for providing all the music for a podcast about something. You gotta stay sassy. Stay classy.